Um, Acts chapter 26, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was from the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and I am judged for the hope and the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought an incredible thing with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought not to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints that I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities." Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me, and them which journeyed with me. And when they were fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, and, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which I have seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me." Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto that heavenly vision, but showed first unto them at Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes have the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets of Moses did say." should come. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for this day. Lord, I just want to thank you, Lord, for the call to preach. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to preach. Lord, I do thank you for us having a church house that's open that we can come to and worship tonight, Lord. And Lord, I thank you for these people that are here, Lord, and I ask you just help me what you've laid upon my heart. Uh, just use me, Lord, to help be a an encouragement to each and every one of us here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, the first thing I want to look at by way of introductions, we just see in verse number one, uh, we see uh, King Agrippa give Paul permission when he tells him, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. We see, uh, uh, and you think about that permission to speak, and I, I wonder how often do we seek permission for certain things in our life. Um, you know, as Pastor alluded to, a little thing going on in his throat and congested and all that. Um, that works, Brother Ron. He can call one of us and ask us to preach because we can't just get up here and just preach while he's doing. You've got to have permission. And Paul is uh, in a position now uh, that he's got to have that uh, permission to go, be able to go and speak for himself. Agrippa offers him that opportunity here to be able to defend himself. And so we see he gets that permission, and in that permission he asked for patience. In verse number 3, he said, especially because I know thee, he's talking about Agrippa, he's giving uh, King Agrippa here a compliment. He goes, because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. How often do we hear patiently? Now, when I say, and I'm not just saying that we just want to get mad at a preacher or anything like that, but how often do we truly hear patiently? How often, if, if Brother Doug was to come up here and say, turn to John 3.16, or we have a tendency to, I've heard everything there is to be preached out of John 3.16, and just turn it off. Or if he starts talking about it and he gives a title, and we think it to be a salvation message, Brother Mike, and we just think, well, I'm already saved. I don't need any of that. Instead of being willing to listen to what he has and listen 
patiently instead of jumping to conclusions about things. You know, a lot of times you even see uh, people that are lost or people that are out in the world, we have a tendency just not to listen to them patiently, not using excuses, but just being willing to listen to them patiently. We see the next few verses that Paul gives, and I'm not going to reread all these, uh, but verses 4 down through around verse 11 or so, he talks about his pharisaical life. And we're, we'll get into that a little bit here in a little bit. Uh, but he just he lays it out how he is, Brother Clint. This is what I used to be. And he, we, we can see that in all those that verses right there. But in verse number 12, we see all of a sudden there's a plan. He has a plan that he's going to Damascus. He's going to go do the exact same thing, Brother Phil, that he's done for years. But then God shows up and changes his plan. At midday, in verse number 13, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. See, he had, he had his own plan, but he had God show up and change his plan. The important thing is the fact that he followed what God then had for him. We'll get to that also. Why? Because Pastor touched on a little bit this morning. Why should we live a life? Why should we be singing and praising him? Because we have a life with purpose. In verse 16, he says, But rise, Jesus telling Paul, Rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things into which will I appear unto thee. And in verse 22, he also goes on talking about how he is having therefore obtained the help of God. He had a purpose in his life. We fail to realize sometimes the purpose that we have in our life. No matter who we are, no matter what our age, no matter where we're at, no matter what we think we have done or haven't done, each and every one of us have a purpose. I'm a firm believer. I've said this at the jail. I've probably said it here. If God had nothing for you to do, you would not be here this evening. You wouldn't be sitting at home this evening. You would be nowhere on this earth if God didn't have something for you to do. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that if we are still here, God has a purpose for us. So we see the purpose, and then in verses 17 and 18, we see the promise. What's he talk about? Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Remember, the Jews were God's chosen people. But he came for the Gentiles also, Brother Ray. We can sit here tonight because of the promise that we have from the Lord Jesus Christ. And the last thing by way of introduction is we see in verse number 22. We could go back and we could look at everything that Paul has been through up till this point. We could look at him being thrown in jail. We can look at the people who, you know, I can remember times when Paul would walk into a city and they'd be like, well, wait a minute, I know who you are. No, 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 you're, you ain't coming here preaching to me. I remember what you're here for. But in verse 22, Paul says, having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day. He just kept pushing forth. He just kept, it wasn't nothing going to stop him. He was just going to keep pushing forth, doing what it was that God had called him to do, doing what God had wanted him to do up till now. Paul lays out his life in these first 22, first 23 verses. And if we was to continue reading, we see in verse number 24, we all know if you're a student of the Bible at all, Festus tells him he's crazy for the most part. But Paul was an open book in front of Agrippa. He laid everything out in his life. Here's, here's who I was, here's who I am now, and here's the reason I am who I am now. And that's all I want to preach on with God's help a little bit, is an open book. Just being an open book. Now, there are certain things uh, that, that we still tend to keep private. There are certain things, Brother Ray, we should keep private. But for the most part, our lives are an open book. People see the way that we live our lives. When you think about an open book, every, and this is, let me I'll let you in on a little something. I have argued with God for probably every bit of two, three weeks about this message. Because this is not the way it was laid out at the beginning. God, it's not, it's not literated just right, Brother Doug. And I can't preach that. I struggle enough. If I don't have it literated, it's not going to work. And so back in my office today, I'm praying, trying to find something else maybe to preach. And God says, okay, here. I'm going to give you these three words, use that, alliterate it, and then just go preach it. So hopefully it'll be as uh, uh, good to you as God gave it to me. But each and every story has a start. I've been studying the last few weeks in Jeremiah, and we know in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse number 5, 
where he says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now, he might not have ordained you to be a prophet, but he still has something for you. We all started in the same place. No matter how much I might have joked with my uh, brothers or my sister or anybody like that, none of us were found under a rock. No matter what might have happened, none of us are here by accident. We all have a purpose, and we all had the same start. And you think about a book, every single book has the beginning. It has the introduction. And we, we, so we were all here, we're all uh, introduced, so to speak. The second thing, each and every book has a stopping point. Some books stop really well. Some of them, you know, that you get done with the book, Brother Phil, and you think you just almost want more. You know, you're, you're wanting the, the, uh, the sequel, so to speak. You're, you're looking for the part two. And some of them might not have such a good finish. You know, you think we can go, we talk about going to the graveyard and there's, uh, uh, you know, graves in there from young to old. You don't want to have to ever bury a child as a parent or anything of that nature. And Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Each and every one of us here tonight, short of Christ's return, we're all going to die. All of our books are going to end the same. So we've reached the point that each and every one of us have started the same, and each and every one of us are going to finish the same. But the last thing, and I'm, I'm not just completely done, Thad, so don't get too excited, okay? Maybe five more minutes. The main thing is what's in the middle of that book. What's the substance? So, so to speak, of what we are living in now, what is the substance, so to speak, of your book? Each and every one of the books that we may pick up and read or each and every story that we have, part of that substance contains people. The people, not only in our lives, but just the people that are the most important. And when I'm, you know, you think of, and I'm sure they still do it and have, uh, uh, when they do award shows and you get, uh, Brother Ray, best supporting actor, supporting actors. We all have people around us that play important roles in our lives. Hopefully this building here tonight is full of the people uh, that are important to you in your life. Hopefully you have those people that you know that you can go to and count on for prayer, Brother Ron. That you know you can call on that if you're just having a bad day that you can maybe talk to them and, and just maybe get a load off your chest, so to speak. We have those supporting characters that need to be in our life, and we need those, and those are important. But they shouldn't be the main character in our life, Brother Donald. Luke chapter 10 and verse 27, And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and, and thy neighbor as thyself. Brother Phil, he should be the main character in our life. God should be that main person in our life that we always will go to turn to. Is he though? Is he that main person? I'm convinced, and I'm not trying to be mean or anything as well. For a lot of people, he's not. I understand there's a lot of kids over there, there's youth back there, but there's still a lot of people that aren't here, that was here just this morning. We couldn't have, uh, I, I understand, you know, we could not have put off building a building just because price were high if everybody who's been here was still here. We would be so packed tonight, even with kids in the back, that we couldn't handle it. Why? Because that one that was most important in their life wasn't God. Their main character, which we'll get to a little bit later, was probably themselves. It wasn't God. And you think, well, that's just harsh, Brother Josh. That's, that's just mean. Well, Luke chapter 14, verse 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. We could go through other things where God tells us, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Anything, you can think it's not a God or call it whatever you want, but if you're putting it before God, it's a God in your life. Little g. You know, I've already wrote the devotion for tomorrow. Uh, that song that we sang this morning, that just touched me. There should be nothing between us and God. Our problem is, and if you want to know the rest of the story, so to speak, you can read the devotion tomorrow. Too many times we look at it as harmless. We just think it's not a big deal. Not a big deal if I do this. It's not a big deal if I go here or go there. And that harmless ends up being very harmful. So not only does the story and this have the substance, does it have the people, it also has the plot. But the story or the book, so to speak is all about. Now, that plot obviously varies greatly. It depends on what kind of book you're, you're picking up and you're reading. But it, so it can vary greatly. Each and every one of us 
have our own plots. Each and every one of us have our own story that varies greatly. None of us are the same. But each one of those stories and each one of those plots, it affects somebody else. Have you ever sat down to read a story and almost just get mad? You almost get fierce like you just want to get in the pages and rip somebody's head off, so to speak. Or you want to get into the pages that it's having an effect on you and, and give somebody a hug or something they're going through. Well, I ask you tonight, what, what does your plot affect? How are you affecting other people? Those people around you, what kind of effect do you have on those that you come into contact with every single day? You know, I talked a little bit about uh, having that job interview. Did I had an effect on me just seeing somebody else there and talk about using their position to be able to help others in any way? You know, it was wonderful to see them talk about, you know, as a company, you can wear your faith on your sleeve. Uh, there's nothing wrong with you talking to your customers or to co-workers about God and the things of God. That was refreshing. Do we do that even just on an individual basis? How much does our life affect others? Each one of those has its plot, and those plots, as we talked about, has an effect on others. Why? Because each and every single one of them has a purpose. What's your purpose? Each and every one of those things, those books you can look at, has a purpose for different, different reasons. You could have a self-help book. You might have all kinds of different things. Each and every one of our lives has a purpose, as we already talked about, for somebody else. If you was to stand up tonight, we all know when we go into eternity, we're going to have to give an account for everything that's been preached here, not been preached here, everything in this book, we're going to have to give an account for. Now, I'm not talking about even just getting an account there. What if pastor had got up tonight and said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start over here. We're going to start with Miss Caitlin. You're going to come up, and you're going to be able to tell your story. And you can come up, and you can tell your story the way you see it, Brother Donald. Now, I'm pretty sure that uh, without, you know, we would try to be humble, and we'd all be honest. You know, we got places we can improve. And, but none of us are going to get up here and act like we're just a heathen. But now, what if somebody else was to write your book? What if somebody else was to write your book tonight? There's four books I want to look at, and I'll be done. That you think of when you think of main books that I remember. You know, you didn't have all this. Maybe you did. I just never read them. You know, when I was in school, brother, I don't remember self-help books and all these kinds of things. These are the four main books that I remember. The first one is fiction. Just fake. Matthew chapter number 7, verse 22 and 23. Many will say to me that in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Even then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Are you, are you fake? You could come in here and we can live the best life on Sunday and Wednesday. That don't mean we're saved. That don't mean we're not fake. As somebody who spent nearly 20 years a lost church member, uh, Brother James, I can tell you, still fake. Might not have been a heathen, might not have been a terrible person living out in the world, but still fake. So I was still lost on my way to hell. What if somebody else was to write our book tonight? Would it be a fiction book? Would they look at us as saying, no, nope, they're just completely fake? Now, being completely the opposite of fiction is you just have nonfiction. Are you true to yourself? Are you true to the things of God? What did God say? What did Genesis say? Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Because Noah was just true. You've seen everything that was going on in the world at that time, how wicked it was, and God was about, was prepared to send the flood, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I, I truly believe there is a group of people that God, uh, obviously we have a remnant that we know of that God can look at and find grace in the eyes of the Lord. Otherwise, we, otherwise I don't know what that was all about. We would not be here tonight. You realize that we got to talking about it this week. We are approaching exactly two years, Brother Donald, that everything happened. When everything, I remember at the beginning of that March or somewhere around in there uh, going down to LMU, and I think at that time you kind of slowly heard things. And just this week I got to thinking about conference basketball tournaments are starting this week. And that's when everything happened two years ago. Because a lot of those, whether it be Wednesday or Thursday, whatever day it was, a lot of those teams, Brother James, were on the court. And they started calling them off. Two years. How thankful are you that we get to meet here tonight after two years? It's not a matter of, you know, just being thankful that we have a pastor that was willing to leave the church open when so many wasn't. What if they had put armed guards at the doors every day? How do you know that's not coming? Are we willing to stay true 
to God? How willing would we be to meet underground like they are doing in some other countries? How true are we? If that book was written about us, would it be nonfiction? The third other type of book, a biography. A biography is about your life written by someone else. Do you follow your steps, Brother Phil, or are you following God's steps for your life? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 4, and we have confidence in the Lord touching you that you both do and will do the things which we command you. What are we more, what are we more focused on? What I want for my life or what God wants for my life? Are we, we are, God has, we've already talked about, God has a purpose for each and every one of us. Are we willing to fulfill that purpose? Or are we worried about making our own steps, doing our own ventures? I want to go do this, and I want to go do that, never giving a second thought to saying, God, what do you want me to do? God, you show me what you want me to do. You, you lead me to a job, or you lead me here, you lead me to a, a church, or lead me to uh, whatever it may be. Or let me say this lastly. Opposite of biography is an autobiography. In Luke chapter number 18, and verses 11 and 12, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in a week and give tithes of all that I possess. And we could go on and read. Are we just all about ourselves? Me, 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 I, 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 I. Is that what we are? Are we all about ourselves? We live in a, uh, a social media-driven world that people just seem to be so completely full of themselves. So we can write our own book. We can get up here, we could say whatever we want. But what would those around us say? If, some, if we was to ask somebody else to write a book about our life, what would somebody else say? Because, see, there's a lot of things going on now I've noticed, and you hear about people writing books. Everybody wants to self-publish their own things because they're not interested in having a, a publisher or something like that tell them what to write. They want to do their own thing. And somehow or another, that's crept into our Christian lives. We're not worried about what God wants us to do. I'm not worried about what the preacher wants me to do. I'm not worried about following what the pastor tells us to do. I want to do my own thing. You know, how many times is, and, and I, I, I don't know why this came into mind. Maybe it's because, you know, I've heard some this week talk about Lent coming up and everybody giving up certain things. Very rarely, even in the time that I've been here, Brother James, has our pastor called for a fast. When he does that, how often do we oblige what he says i won't say oblige is the right words first word but how much or how often do we say this is what pastor said to church to do this is what i'm going to do and i say that because too many times i know what's best for me i can't go all day without eating i can't go all day without my phone i can't go all day without tv i'll do me let him worry about the church that's the kind of society we live in now and i'm afraid that's the kind of society that's that has come over into us and that's what's keeping us from revival you know, if you've seen the last, and, and I don't know how everything works, I just know how I do, I know how it goes, none of us fellas talk to each other about what we're doing the devotions on. We don't clear up and make sure nobody's writing this or writing that. You know, some send it to Brother Aaron, he publishes it, I publish mine. We don't go seeing what everybody else does. If you've noticed, the last two days have been about revival. We would have revival if we would write more nonfiction and biography books as opposed to more fictions and autobiographies. When we let it to begin to be about him and him only, that's what it would be. Whether you realize it or not, we're all an open book. There are people watching us day after day after day that we don't even think about. Let me share this real quick and I'll be done. This happened this morning. I was, I was thinking after we sang that song and I was thinking about uh, uh, writing that devotion, talking about being harmless um, Sister Tina come in after Sunday school. Brother Peter over there had a, a pack of gum, and it was sitting there, and she said, and she asked Sister Dawn, she goes, do you think I get a piece of his gum? And Dawn said, sure. Opens up his gum, gives it to him. Natalie, standing up here, looks back there at Miss Dawn, says, I'm telling Dad on you. She had no idea she was watching. Somebody's always watching us. Whether we want to think it's around here, regardless, God's still watching us. He knows exactly what kind of book we would be. God knows exactly, if he was to come down here today, he knows exactly what kind of book would be written about us. So what kind of book would you have written about you tonight? We're all an open book, whether we want to admit it or not. But what kind of book would be written about you? I'm done, Pastor.
Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.